Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Patrick Byrne. And I'm here today from Hanover, New Hampshire. I've searched for a uh, couple questions upon which I might get the two of you to disagree. Uh, first, what level of taxation, and I, and I direct these as much to Mr. Munger, therefore, as to you, Mr. Buffett. First, what level of taxation on capital gains is most conducive to the long-term economic health of a society? And is that also the fair or just rate? In other words, is the just rate of, ta of taxation on capital gains precisely that rate that creates the most economic stuff, or is there some other goal the state might pursue? And as a not so subtly re related question, I, uh, I work in a New Hampshire factory that makes industrial torches. As CEO, I might add, Patrick. <laughs> Say again? As CEO of that, that workings made it sound like you were down there on the floor. I just wanted people to... <laughs> Patrick writes me letters from chairman to chairman, so I, I think we've got to get him back at it. <laughs> Continuing. Uh, well, it's a small company. I do work as CEO, but it's uh, not much of a hierarchy. Uh, we make torches used in heavy manufacturing, and the fortunes of our uh, factory echo those of industrial America. Do you agree with the conventional wisdom that maintains that the age of classical industrial America has passed, and that we will that America cannot be competitive in the long term with uh, low-wage countries? So the first question is on. Uh, taxation of capital gains, and then the second is on uh, the future for industrial America. I have a sensational answer on the tip of my tongue, but I think I'll let Charlie go first. Well, I'll refine it a bit. <laughs> well, I think there's an easy answer to your capital gain issue, and one is what makes an economy work best in some abstract mathematical sense. And the other is the consideration that you allude to, which gets into issues of fairness. And it's as Aristotle felt that systems worked better when they were generally perceived as fair. The civilization worked better if people saw the differences and rewards as having been fairly uh, reasonably fair anyway. And I think that if you had a civilization where if you work 90 hours a week driving a taxi cab with no money, no medical insurance and so forth, and somebody else does nothing but own Berkshire Hathaway shares and sit on the country club porch and peel off a few every year to pay the bills, uh, that would be regarded as so unfair that even if it had some theoretical economic efficiency, it would be counterproductive for our particular civilization to uh, have that kind of a tax code. So I'm all for having some taxation of, of capital gains. Once you reach that conclusion, you get into the question of what, should, what is the fair rate? Uh, I think the fair rate might well be a little lower than it is now, but not much lower. Sounds to me like he's a seller. The Berkshire. <laughs> uh, Patrick is a um, former heavyweight boxer and uh, just got his PhD fairly recently from Stanford with a 700 page dissertation, which has in it some commentary that actually bears on this. And I, and I, and I thank Patrick actually for introducing me to a, uh, to a uh, uh, kind of a system of uh, construct, mental construct that, that to attack questions like this. Patrick gave me the example one time, and I think this may go back to John Rawls at, at Harvard, but he said, just imagine that you were going to be born 24 hours from now, and you had been granted this extraordinary power to determine the rules, the economic rules, of the society 
that you were going to enter, and those rules were going to prevail for your lifetime and your children's lifetime and your grandchildren's lifetime. Now you, you've got this ability in this 24-hour period to make this decision as to the structure, but there's a, as in most of these genie-type questions, there's one hooker. You don't know whether you're going to be born black or white. You don't know whether you're going to be born male or female. You don't know whether you're going to be born bright or retarded. You don't know whether you're going to be born infirm or able-bodied. You don't know whether you're going to be born in the United States or Afghanistan. In other words, you're going to participate in 24 hours in what I call the ovarian lottery. You know, it's, the most, it's the most important event in which you'll ever participate. You know, it's going to determine way more than what school you go to, how hard you work, all kinds of things. You're going to get one ball drawn out of a barrel that probably contains 5.7 billion balls now. And that's you. Now, what kind of a society are you going to construct with that in prospect? Well, I suspect you would focus on two issues that Patrick uh, mentioned in his question. You would try to figure out a system that is going to produce an abundant amount of goods and where that abundance is going to increase at a rapid rate during your lifetime and your children and your grandchildren so they can live better than you do in aggregate and the grandchildren can live better. So you'd want some system that turned out what people wanted and needed, and it, you'd want something that turned them out in increasing quantities uh, for as far as the eye could see. But you would also want a system that, that, while it did that, treated the people that did not win the ovarian lottery in a way that you would want to be treated if, if you were in their position, because a lot of people don't win the lottery. I mean, Charlie, when we were born, the odds were over 30 to 1 against being born in the United States. You know, just winning that portion of the lottery, enormous plus. We wouldn't be worth a damn in Afghanistan. You know, we'd be giving talks and nobody would be listening. <laughs> Terrible. That's the worst of all worlds. Uh, so we want it that way. We, we want it partially in the era in which we were born by being born male. You know, it, uh, partially in the era in which we were born by being born male. Uh, had, and 50% uh, of the talent in the country had, and 50% uh, of the talent in the country was excluded from in a very large part from virtually all occupations. Uh, we won it by being white. You know, it, it, no, no tribute to us. It just happened that way. And we won it in another way by being wired in a certain way, which we had nothing to do with that happens to enable us to be good at valuing businesses. And, uh, you know, is that the greatest talent in the world? No, it just happens to be something that pays off like crazy in this system. Now, when you get through with that, you still want to have a system where the people that are born like Bill Gates or Andy Grove or something get to turn those talents to work in a way that really maximizes those talents. I mean, it would be a crime to have Bill or Andy or people like that or Tom Murphy working in some pedestrian occupation just because you had this great egalitarian instinct. But the, the trick, it seems to me, is to have some balance that causes the people who have the talents that can produce goods that people want in a market society to turn them out in great quantity and to keep wanting to do it all their lives. And at the same time, takes the people that lost the lottery and make sure that just because they you know, on that, on that one moment in time, they got the wrong ticket. Uh, don't live a life that's dramatically worse than the people that were luckier. And uh, when I get all through with that long speech, I probably come out with the idea that the capital gains tax as it exists today is probably about right. So that's, that's I see very few people, and I've, I've, I've been around uh, a lot of people with money and talent over time. They don't always go together, but I've been around both classes. <laughs> and the, I see very few of them that are turned off from using their talents by a 28 percent. It doesn't happen. I mean, they do what they like to do. And 
part of the reason they're good at what they do is they like to do it. And, and I just, I've just never seen it happen. And uh, I've seen a lot of people that pay taxes that are higher than 28 percent that are contributing more to society by some judgment other than a pure market system. The, the low-cost industrial, you know, you know, software that where a Microsoft has been leading or, or an Intel or something, I mean, we, we have done very well. You know, software that where a Microsoft has been leading or, or an Intel or something, I mean, we, we have done very well. And here we are with our unemployment rate in Nebraska, it's under 3 percent. You know, you look at the countries of Europe that were supposedly going to beat us into the ground, or you look at Japan. And uh, I think I think the American economy encourages adaptation. I mean, Singapore may be better, but but in terms of major, large economies, I think the American economy does awfully well in encouraging adaptation to uh, what people want, delivering it to them, and uh, in ever increasing amounts. And uh, you know, I view that as all to the good. So. I don't, uh, I don't regard any industry as sacred. It, uh, uh, I regard innovation and, and, and uh, freeing up the able people to uh, uh, able in terms of, a, of, of production of goods in a market economy to, to spend 12 hours a day uh, all the time. I, I, don't, I don't see Andy or Bill letting up at all in, in terms of where Intel and Microsoft are now. I don't see Roberto Guizueta at Coca-Cola or Michael Eisner at Disney or any of those people. Uh, they don't work 40-hour weeks. They work. They work. They work 70 or 80-hour weeks, and uh, um, I think that system works very well in this country. And I don't worry particularly about the specific products that are turned out. Charlie, I would not like the conclusion that both Warren and I have reached that issues of fairness are properly to be considered in the tax laws. To cause anyone here to believe that I have a great respect for. Harvard University's philosopher John Rawls. Uh, he is perhaps the world's best known living philosopher. And uh, personally, I think he's had a pernicious influence on human thought. He doesn't know enough science, he doesn't know enough economics, he doesn't know enough uh, about how systems work to be really good at figuring out what's fair in systems. And uh, you know, he studied too much philosophy and too little of everything else. So uh, I, if anybody thinks we love John Rawls, well, you can count me out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wasn't endorsing his conclusions. I was endorsing yeah. his, uh, his, his, his thought, his, his original uh, construct. <clears throat> Charlie, how about, how about the industry's part of the question that Patrick asked? Well, if Patrick isn't the smartest person in the room, uh, there can't be many in his class. The, you are getting questions from a very able man, and he's deliberately made them very difficult. <laughs> and uh, that whole issue is uh, too complex for me to usefully discuss here. There are also certain limitations on ability that enter the equation. <laughs> so we'll go to zone 10.